If you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask you to turn to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 7, and we're going to begin reading in verse 15. Uh, as you're turning there, uh, again, be prayerful for the outreach of the church, be prayerful for the work the Lord's given you to do. Uh, I don't believe that He uh, saves folks just to warm pews. Uh, so there's something out there that you can do to uh, further the gospel. Uh, God, uh, Hebrews chapter 7, beginning in verse 15. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testified, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and the unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And insomuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. For those for those priests were not for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank You for Your goodness. We thank You for Your mercy that brought us here this morning. We know by grace alone that You allow us and even implant a desire in us to be at the Lord's house on the Lord's day. And we give You great glory and honor for that. Lord, we pray for each and every individual, from the youngest to the oldest that's among us this morning, that you might speak to them this morning. Uh, we pray for the saved, Lord, that you might show them uh, the magnitude of the mercy and the sufficiency of the sacrifice that lays in you. Lord, and for the lost, that today might be the day that you speak life to them, that they might understand and know their sinful condition, and that you might save them. According to your mercy and grace, we pray it. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, uh, this morning I'll be preaching to you uh, being secure forever in Christ. Now, we live in a day and age where the security of the Lord's people is constantly questioned. Uh, it's con con constantly put under scrutiny and people even make, make fun of that doctrine. And another thing that I see in, that's growing in number and constantly today is people embracing the law, not as a schoolmaster, but as its sufficiency. Uh, listen, the law was never sufficient in even any way. The smallest of law, one commandment was broken by mankind, and forever that showed his, uh, his inadequacy, and in that sense, the inadequacy of the law. Uh, we are not able to keep it, nor have we ever been able to keep the law. It's simply to show us that we're sinners. And you think that that would be an evident truth, but the older I get, the more I realize even the fact that you're sinful is a revealed truth. You can't come to that on your own. You won't come to that on your own. You may nod your head and say yes, but the, to see how awful you are is truly a gift of God. That doesn't happen naturally. And so we see that I believe the writer of Hebrews could be Paul. It could have been someone else. It's very consistent with his writing. And I think the reason, maybe if it is a Paulician letter, the reason he didn't sign it is that he was a little, had a little bit of enmity against the church at Jerusalem. He had to rebuke, rebuke Peter openly uh, because Peter was what? Embracing the law. He was reintroducing it. In fact, uh, he, he wouldn't sit with the Gentile believers. And, and, and that, that was upsetting to Paul. And Paul says that he rebuked him to his face. And in other words, he corrected him. And, and here again, seemingly in 2017, we're reliving this. <coughs> Excuse me. But whoever the writer, he understood Christ in a great and wonderful way. Verse 15 it says, And it is yet far more evident, for after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. Now, a priest, excuse me. Now, what we'll, what we'll see is two things about 
is the order of Melchizedek and the similitude of Melchizedek. They're two different things, two different origins. But the similitude, that means the likeness, the, 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 the consistencies, the, what they shared together. And this was the similitude of Melchizedek, no beginning or no end. Uh, 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 at the very dawn of creation, he said, let us make man in our own image. Christ being present, the Son of God, very active in creation. Uh, in, in the throwing in of the, of the Hebrew children into the fiery furnace, they said, uh, I see a fourth man and his, his life unto the Son of God, meaning Christ, there in the furnace with those three Hebrew children that stood up when nobody else would stand up. That's the similitude of Melchizedek. See, he's more sufficient than any Jewish priest that could ever live. Right. And, and this is where you lose the Jews, Christ was not in the bloodline to be a priest. He was from a, a tribe that was looked down upon. He was from a tribe that they didn't consider adequate. Uh, the Levites, all the priests, he did not descend from the Levitical tribe. And, and, and so we see then that, yes, he certainly was because his priestly order was better and far more reaching and, and far more pure than even the Levitical priest, verse 16, who, meaning Christ, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power or the authority of an endless life. And, and so, again, it's saying just as Melchizedek had no beginning in the end, Christ had no beginning or end, and so he's a very, very adequate priest. That's why we pray in his name. We don't have to pray in Mary's name. and We don't have to pray in, in, in the Pope's name. Uh, we can go boldly under the throne on the merit of Christ and Christ alone. You know what? Uh, it's a shame and a disgrace that our prayer lives are so, uh, so anemic and so weak and so, and so hindered by the world because that's a great privilege. Yeah. To, approach, to approach God on the merit of Christ Listen, we should run to the throne and be glad to pray and, and thank God that we have the privilege to go before the great God Jehovah on the merit of what? A priest after the order of Melchizedek. See, Christ fulfilled a great more than just the Levitical law. He was a special, a sect of priest in and of himself. Verse 17, For he, meaning Christ, testified... Or he meaning God testified there are priests forever after the order of Melchizedek. So we see the similitude of Melchizedek. Uh, no beginning, no end. A constant person. A constant entity. Always there. Always doing his job. And now we find that he's a priest like Melchizedek. And, and he did fulfill the priestly office. Remember at the resurrection, he said, Touch me not yet, Mary, for I'm not yet ascended. Because he had a sacrificial work to do. See, only the priest could do those sacrifices. Now, I personally believe Melchizedek certainly was a type of Christ, if not Christ, when he appeared to Moses in the wilderness, and after he got Lot and his bunch back, he tithed on what he'd won in the battle. Moses meaning, so you don't tithe to anybody but God. That makes sense. Right. Have you ever thought, and Moses was faithful to that, and he did do it, but the tithes just disappear. And to me, the only person that could disappear something is God. He was at least a type of unto God. He was a type of unto Christ. And so Melchizedek, uh, so we find that Christ is in the similitude of Melchizedek, and also he's in his priestly order like unto Melchizedek. And you know what? That's, that, that's sufficient in the law. You know what? I don't need the law to become a Christian. I don't need the law to stay saved. The law is my schoolmaster. It told me that I was inadequate. It told me that I was sinful. It told me that there was nothing whatsoever I could do to be saved. That's what the law did to me. Now, I had a lot of good teachers over the years. Good teachers. Very knowledgeable. Very knowledgeable. And I learned a lot from them. Stuff I still, I still understand today. And... 
He taught, the law taught me this, that I was a sinner. That's a, that's a wonderful principle to learn. Uh, most people never really come to that truth. They think they do, but they don't. And as Brother Junior alluded to in his, in his Sunday school lesson this morning, the reason I know they never understand it is because they think they can keep it. They, 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 they think that it's more than that it's a saving merit somehow in that. Uh, verse 18. For there is verily or, or truly a disannulling of the commandment going before the weakness and the unprofitableness thereof. Don't you get that? The law is disannulled. You, you, know, you know what that means? If you go before a judge and you're have you ever heard of a marriage being disannulled? It's a little bit different than a divorce. When it's disannulled, you're relieved from it. A divorce just ends a marriage. A disannulment means you're no longer under the obligation. You know what? He disannulled the law for me and for you and for every individual that's ever been saved and born again. And I also want you to see that the writing says of the law itself it wasn't beneficial. It wasn't adequate. It wasn't what needed to be done. So why is it in this modern day that people are embracing it once again as a means of redemption? I, I'll never understand that. I'll never get it. When the Bible's so clear and, and it says it's just an old. Uh, we're, not, we're not under obligation. We don't have to do it. We don't have to embrace it. We, we, we don't have to be good for redemption. And the reason why we never ever could do it to start with. We're inadequate. This flesh, this flesh is just bent on sin. And it loves sins and craves sins. Brother Terry and I was talking about an individual at break time. And we're talking, we are talking about how seemingly that once sin is present, you just give yourself over to it. That becomes who you are. You, you know how an alcoholic becomes an alcoholic? They're given over to that sin. And they crave it. And they want it more than food. And, and so we see then that the law was not, was not adequate in a redeeming sense. For the law made nothing perfect or complete or whole, but the bringing in of a better hope did. Now what a wonderful thing uh, to know that we needed something better than the law. We needed something better than a schoolmaster to say, hey, you're inadequate. You're sinful. You need Christ. We need something better. And Christ brought in a better hope. Something sufficient, something adequate, something that we could build, uh, uh, build upon a foundation that He's able. You know what? What a wonderful, wonderful thing that is. You know, a lot of people <coughs> over the years has called me a legalist. And the reason they do that, they hate the doctrine of separation. That, that, that's the real thing. Uh, they don't have, they're not shooting guns at me, they're shooting guns at the Word of God. That's what it really is. And I'm not a legalist because you know what a legalist is? They believe there's adequacy in the, in the law of God. And I don't believe that. I don't believe there ever was adequacy in the law of God because it's impossible to keep it. But now I do believe this. You better come out from among them and be separate. And if you don't believe that, that gets right back to what Brother Terry and I was talking. You let yourself into that mess and it'll take over your life. It'll take over your life. And and so we see, uh, we see then that we have a better thing than the law. The law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did. In other words, made us complete, made us perfect, by the which, <laughs> meaning Christ, we draw nigh unto God. So how this morning are you drawing unto God? If you're close to Him, you do that on the merit of Christ. If you're near unto God this morning, it's by the goodness of Christ. It's by the sufficiency of His sacrifice. If you get to stand near Him, it's all of Christ. And we should go boldly that way. Verse 20. And, is a, and in as much as not without an oath, He was made priest. Now, I, I want you to see that he, he didn't have to go 
in front of the Sanhedrin and make a Levitical oath. They did. They had to promise their lives. From uh, the time that they were old enough to fulfill the priestly office to the day that they died. That's what they had to do. Uh, that's why uh, John's father was down at the temple, Zacharias, when he went, when he went dumb because he didn't believe God. He, he was doing a commandment that he committed to probably 80 years before that. And he was still fulfilling it. And so here we find this, this man called Jesus that comes in and, and he fulfills something better and he don't go, he's not attached to the law, he's not given to the law, but rather a better thing. Something that's improved, something that's wonderful and glorious. Verse 21, For those priests were made without an oath, but this with, with an oath by him he said it by that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent that thou art priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Now, a testament, you know what a testament is? It's a legal document. Uh, if I if I go in death, me and Donald was actually talking about this morning. We need to get out a will or a testament saying this and this and this. What little bit of earthly goods we have, this is what we got done with. That becomes a legal document. It's binding. And we find that the better testament is this. It's Christ. It's Christ and Christ alone. Why, why He's minimized today is this, is because, see, Satan can, inter can infringe on the area of the law. Did you know that? That's why He says, Thou shalt not surely die. See, the, the, the law, the sentence was death, right? And so he infringed on the law and said, you're not going to really die. You'll kind of die, but you won't really die. And so he can get into that ground, but he can't get into the ground of grace, can he? He, he? he can't venture there because it's not on our merit. He knows that. that. That's why he invited Christ to come down from the cross. Everybody said that, <coughs> that the devil had, had a party when Christ died. He did not. Most upsetting day he ever lived because he didn't want Christ to die because he knew that didn't end the law forever. He, he wanted Christ to come down. He wanted it to be insufficient because see, if he could have interfered with that, the law would not have been fulfilled. And so he wanted, he wanted to end that. Don't, don't be duped into that that, that, he, that, that the devil was, was that the devil had a victory party the day of the cross. He did not. If anything, he had a boo boo party. And and so we see then, uh, as the Lord's people today, that we should stand alone in the sufficiency of Christ. Now, the reason that people have an issue with it today is this. They're not real comfortable with their experience with Christ. And I tell you, the biggest reason because of it is this. is this junk of inviting Jesus into your heart. You know what? That's pretty shaky ground, ain't it? And the reason why is because it depends on you. Yeah. And so they had to come up with something different. Well, I'm a pretty good Joe. You know what? I hadn't killed nobody. I hadn't cheated on my wife. The law's not too bad. And so they re-embrace it. They re-embrace it. And, and, and so then we as the Lord's people, and you ever thought about this, and I thought about this often, <clears throat> from the days of Noah to the time of Moses. You know the only law that we really know about is sacrifice. We don't have thou shalt not. We don't say, have any thou shalts. It just they just stood in sacrifice. That's why whenever uh, <laughs> Cain slew Abel, what were they doing? They were sacrificing. <laughs> when, uh, when uh, Abraham was take, was commanded to tell to take Isaac up on the mount and offer him there, 
You know what? They had to know about sacrifice because he did it. He knew what to do. See, <laughs> the law has never been beneficial, has it? All it did was say, we need a sacrifice. We need a sacrifice. We need a sacrifice. And the sacrifice came and the sacrifice was fulfilled. Why? Because we're inadequate to keep it. We have no ability whatsoever to be good in any fashion or form. Now, I want you to go uh, to the book of 1 John. And I am going to reread a lot of what Brother Junior read. Not because he's not adequate, but because that's the way. It's amazing. Sometimes how the Lord will do that. So the best thing I can come to is y'all need to hear this today. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, in the very first uh, uh, verse, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Now, did you get that? In other words, you take notice, you look at it real careful at the strength, the manner, the form, the, the, the ability of the love of God that He has given us, that He's placed. And, and it says bestowed. It doesn't say that you worked for it. He just took that unbelievable love and, and bestowed it, set it upon us. Uh, he didn't have to, we didn't have to ask for it. He just handed it to us. Why? Because He's God. And He says... You, 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 you look at the manner of love. Now, manner means type. Now, uh, if me and, and me and Donna were both nurses was going to start an IV, I guarantee you we would set up different. And I know we will because we have. Uh, and, and we do it just a little bit different. On that, you know what? The, the, the end result is the same and the individual gets an IV in their vein. But we do it different. So he's saying, you look at how God loved you. And, and the way they loved us was this. It was a sacrificial love. It, it, it was the giving of His own dear Son. It, it was placing Him on an altar in a position He didn't have to be. That was the manner in which He loved you. It's a sacrificial love, a love that's sufficient, a love, a love that's holy, and a love that's good. That is the manner in which He loved us. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Now, you get that down, and you get down real careful, because you know what that says to me? Listen, we're not going to pack this building out except on fellowship night. And you know why? They don't know us out there. They don't know who we are. They don't know what we're about. You know why? The only conclusion I can come to is they really don't know Christ. Right. Now, we, 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 we have something special. You know what? Don't beat yourself up over numbers. Because the best I can tell... We're going to be a, few, a group that's few. A group that's not, not, not very numerous. Because, why? Because the world just don't get grace. They don't understand that it can't be of us in any way. Verse 2. <coughs> Beloved, he's addressing the church. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doeth not yet appear what we shall be, uh, you're, you're born again. You belong to Him. You're not, you're not uh, what you will be. Verse, uh, the rest of that verse. But we know that when He shall appear. Now, if you write in your Bible, you circle and star that appear. Because that, that, that ain't... That's one of us that teaches us about the appearing of Christ and the catching away as opposed to the millennial kingdom. See, he'll just appear in the clouds and say, come, we'll go home and be with the Lord, seven year wedding party, and all hell will break loose here on earth while we're having a glorious time. Don't fret nothing. You, won't, you, you know what? These people huh, that say, oh, I sure hate I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be crying in heaven over what's going on. No, you won't. We'll be so holy and so separate from this world. We won't care what's going on down here. Good care of us. You know why? We'll be in the same with Christ. 
We'll just be wor- we'll just be worshiping. We'll, 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 we'll be at the preparation party. We'll be at the party that they had. Uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll be getting ready for the for the huge time in the Lord when He shall appear. We shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Now, think back to the days after the resurrection. Because they didn't always know Him, did they? The two on the road to Emmaus didn't know Him until He revealed Himself. Uh, You know when you'll know Him? Here and now you'll know Him when He wants you to. It's a revealing. See, the, the, the two on the road to Emmaus didn't know Him until Christ wanted Him to know Him, right? We end up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. Transfigured before Him. See, He was in a different form. And He says, don't you tell nobody about it yet. See, uh, in, this, in, in this dispensation, uh, we're going to be like We're going to have that godly body. We're going to have something different than we presently have. Verse 3, And every man that have this hope in him purified himself even as he is pure. Now I want to give you two thoughts because uh, works based people are going to give you this. Number one, he is purifying us. And number two, the text is very clear. You better, you better purify yourself. Now I'm not talking about a, I'm not talking about an inward man. You can't do that. But you know Reed, the reason I don't grow my hair out is because the Bible tells me not to. That makes sense, right? You know why I don't wear short britches? Because the Bible says I'm to dress modestly. You know why I don't put on a dress? Because the Bible says I'm to wear that pertaining to a man. I'm a man. I'm a guy. That makes sense? Yeah. And I know a lot of supposed believers that refuse to do that. And you know what it is? They're not purifying themselves. They're, they're not dug into the Word enough to know that that Word speaks directly to them. It says what it means. It means what it says. So, yes, He purifies us spiritually, but you better with a long, hard look at your routine life and think about what you say and how you say it, and then it lines up with that book. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and so we as the Lord's people need to be on the guard and, and look at ourselves and look at how we present. Verse 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And we know that He was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him is no sin, perfect sacrifice. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, but whosoever hath not seen him, neither known him. Now, I want you to see the Bible says, whosoever shall abideth in sin. Uh, you know what? Look at people over the long term. Abideth. Where do you abide? Where do I abide right now? Me and Donald's lived at 221 Tobacco Port Road for over 20 years. I like my house. I like where I'm at. That's home to me. Where I abide. Now, what does the Bible say concerning the church at Antioch in chapter 9? And they were first called Christians at Antioch, right? Why? Because they, they carried the similitude of Christ. Now, do you? And you know what? As much as I enjoy the teachings of biblical separation, just because you wear a dress all the time doesn't make you the symbol to the Christ. Just because you don't have a foul mouth does not make you the symbol to the Christ. What about your love? What about going through Clarksville and you come off the 374 there to get on the room of Wilma Rudolph. And I use this example because I used to hit that way to work. And 
at least two out of five mornings, and usually more than that, there was a bum sitting of some kind right under the bypass, wanting food. And before I even could get myself, I'm like, you know what, if he'd get off his tail and work a little bit, he wouldn't be there. Now, is that true? I have to say most of the time, yeah, probably. But do I know that? No. What's two bucks? Right? See, am I showing the similitude of Christ when I do that? Probably not, right? Probably not. <coughs> so in addition to biblical separation, are you sharing the love of Christ? Do you present like Christ? Do, do you present with a, with a sense of love about you? Verse 7, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Is the works there? Very important question. In a day when uh, grace had been so misused that you could live like a dog and, and claim redemption. Verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested. For what purpose? Because of sin. For this purpose the Son of Man was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, <clears throat> what was the primary work of the devil? To bring mankind down. That was his primary objective. And you know what? In the flesh he succeeded wonderfully. And if you don't believe that, just sit around and think a while. It's quarter to you. You'd be like, oh, I wish Larry would shut up. I'm hungry. Right? You know why you do that? You know why you think that? It's the flesh. Yeah. And, uh, but praise be God, he, he took care of all that, did he not? He's sufficient. He's able. Uh, he's good. He's wonderful. He's marvelous when we think about what he's done for us. <coughs> Verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doeth not commit sin. For his, meaning Christ's seed, remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. That is grace, that is a security of the believer. But again, let me, let me give you this fair warning. It is not a license to sin, and as your life and your study progresses, it should become more obvious that you love the Lord Jesus Christ. That you honor Him for who He is. That you lift His name up and that you praise Him as you ought. That should be who you are. You know what? I, I knew a lady uh, when I was younger. And every time she, when she answered the phone, she didn't say hello. When she picked up the phone, she said, Praise the Lord. And I'm like, Miss Ingrid, how are you doing? Uh... Miss Ingrid Benmore. And you know what? She didn't do it to be lavish. She knew what she said. And that was a woman that two times that got the phone call none of us want to hear. Two different daughters died in two very different circumstances. Now could you do that? Still pick up the phone and say praise the Lord. See, that, that is showing Christ, is it not? That, 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 that is conveying who Christ is. And, and so we ought to rejoice and be glad this morning that it doesn't depend on what we do, but rather that it depends completely on the, the person of Christ. Now, uh, I, want to, I want to show you very quickly in the book of Ephesians, and I know you know this, but I want you to see the reason behind it and the reason that it, that it is just this way uh, is to bring glory to Christ. Now, that's another thing with Armenian thought, and another thing with the works-based salvation is whom does it bring glory to? Does that make sense? Because you know what a works-based salvation ultimately does? It brings glory to you. If you're clinging to good works, one day you can say, Woo! I finally made it! And they do. 
And, and so I want, I want to show you the purpose of your salvation. In Ephesians chapter 1, the Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, not by, not by His will, to the saints which are in Ephesus and to the faithful, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> to this faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. According, in other words, the, the origin of these spiritual blessings, according as He had chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. See, the reason that He saved you is to bring great glory and honor unto Himself. It wasn't to relieve you from the miseries of hell, but rather to bring glory and honor and praise to Himself. And I'll show you how that works. When you think about how debauched you really are, when I think about how ungodly that I have been, and He displays me one day as a trophy of grace, I saved Him as vile as He was, as disgusting as He was, I made him a child of the king. And they'll be amazed at that, that, he, that he can do that even for me. And he'll give great praise and glory and honor. And that's what it's about. Yeah. It's not a hell escape experienced. And so we see that grace is sufficient because it brings glory to, to himself. It brings great glory and praise and honor uh, <coughs> to Jesus instead of us. Verse 5, having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. Now, if He sets out to say that it doesn't accomplish, then He gets no glory, right? You know, God has never set out to do one thing that He didn't get done. And if He sets out to save an individual, it will happen. So, only thing you can come to to give him the honor that's due his name is he never meant to save everybody. If you don't believe that, read Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 9. Because he said, me. John chapter 17, me. He didn't, he didn't say, you know what, if he wanted to accomplish it that way, certainly he could have. But you know what, he. In his own wisdom, in his own in his own glory, he wanted vessels of wrath too. Could you imagine the ungod the, the unbelievable wrath leashed upon Madame Marilyn O'Hare? And you know what? She deserves every bit of it. That'll bring glory to her. I mean to him. I don't understand it completely, but I know that it will. Because it will illustrate how righteous and holy and sovereign He really is. Why she was not an elect, I don't know. But I know that according to this, that's how He gets His praise. Verse 6, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption. How? Through His blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of His, what? Grace. Wherein He, made it, wherein he have abounded toward us, in all wisdom and prudence, having met... Now, I'm gonna, I can't pass that verse 8 up without noting prudence. Uh, you know what prudence does? It's attention to detail. When you're in nursing school, you always learn about nurse prudence. Did you think prudently? Was your assessment prudent? You know how most nursing problems happen? Someone just didn't do a good assessment. They didn't look close enough. He looked at every detail. He looked at every spot in my life. He looked at every piece of the Levitical law. He was prudent. Every detail he took care of. That salvation by grace. That salvation that's built upon God and not upon myself because no doubt I would forget something in the mix. But God doesn't. It's not possible for Him to have, for that to happen. Verse 9, Having made known unto us the mystery 
of His will. Now, if you underline in your Bible, you get that His will because that's the only will that matters. Your will means nothing. You know, uh, He'll reveal His will for your life in many, many ways. But the first one is always this. You're mine. And then He might have a will for you to preach the Gospel. He might have a, a will for you to uh, call elderly people. He might have a will for you to take in children. I don't know about that. But it's according to His will. That's, uh, that's salvation by grace. Salvation, anything less than that, is a meritorious salvation. It really, doesn't, uh, it really doesn't exist at all. Having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure which He hath purposed in Himself, that in the dis dispensation of the fullness of time He might gather together in one all things in Christ. Now, there's your clincher for people who want to embrace the law and become Jewish. He embraced it Himself. All things, all peoples under Christ. That's why they were first called Christians at Antioch. Saved Jews were not called Jew Christians. They were called Christians. Saved Muslims are not called Muslim Christians. They're called Christians. See, so we're under that um umbrella of the goodness and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Plus nothing, minus nothing. And we're going to be giving great praise and great glory for that. See, uh, as things roll along, I think we as the Lord's people are going to have to defend more and more salvation by simple, simple grace. Now, now the, the affecting of that is through the person of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. And that's beyond my comprehension, but I, I do know this. It starts with the Lord God convincing of your, your need for salvation. That you're hopeless and helpless and miserable. You know what? I like to see lost people miserable, don't you? Yeah. I do. I like to see them where they can't sleep. I like to see them where that's all they think about is the fierceness of God's wrath, the hotness of hell. I like to see them because you know what? For those individuals, salvation is not long. But people that can sit, and it's just like water's off a duck's back, those are the ones I worry about. Those are the ones that's a special matter of prayer. Because, listen, that, they're not even troubled. Uh, do you know Him? Do you know what grace is about? Do you understand that He died for your sins? Do you understand and know that uh, <laughs> salvation is, is through Him? Do you know that you're, sin that you're a sinner? Have you ever really been convinced of that? I I I'll go so far to say this. If you've never been convinced you're a sinner, you're still lost. Because you won't cry out to the Savior until you know you need Him. 